All right, so it is my great pleasure to welcome my very old friend, uh, Andreas Kalivas, who is a professor of uh, political science at the New School. He is, uh, uh, I would say, one of the real stars of the New School. He is making a face, but uh, I am expressing my own uh, very honest uh, point of view. As you know, I'm always honest about these things. And to me, you're one of the four or five people who are still keeping the, uh, the graduate program alive and linked to its historical traditions. And uh, that to me is, is very, very important. But of course, for you, more important uh, is the fact uh, that you have received your MAs and PhDs in political science at Columbia. Previous education is in your native Greece, uh, where you have gotten your bachelor's uh, degree. You have uh, published uh, uh, two uh, books, formally speaking, uh, the uh, Democracy and the Politics of the Extraordinary and Liberal Beginnings, which was co-authored with Ira Katz, uh, uh, Katz Nelson. Uh, but aside from that, from that, there is also the current project, which is uh, uh, currently called uh, Tyranny Legalized Republicanism, Dictatorship, and the Enemy Within. The fact is that you have published articles uh, on which this uh, work will uh, draw, Democracy and the Poor, uh, Whose Crisis, and I think most uh, uh, closest to the title is The Tyranny of Dictatorships, When the Greek Tyrant Meets the Roman Dictator. Uh, uh, Andreas Kalivas is, however, is going to address uh, uh, the, uh, the topic of contemporary forms of authoritarianism, but he will do with it exactly what he wants, uh, since uh, he is uh, uh, an expert in, uh, in many of the areas uh, that concern this class. It will be his choice to emphasize uh, whichever part he's interested in. He will give a 40, to, uh, 40 minutes to an hour lecture. It's again his choice. And then after that, we will have a discussion. So welcome, Andreas. Uh, uh, we're really uh, very, very happy to have you. And uh, as I look around the room, uh, there are many of, many of your current and former students uh, who are also here. So Andreas, please. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for inviting me to, to talk about uh, um, an issue that uh, might or might not relate uh, with uh, the topic of this uh, course, because uh, am I, if there was a title, um, if I had to choose a title, that would be the political logic of dictatorship. I don't know how it might relate uh, to questions of populism, but uh, I think tendentially um, uh, it is uh, uh, relevant uh, for questions of authoritarianism. Uh, although the main emphasis is on uh, dictatorship, um, uh, it's not so much, uh, there is a, a, an historical dimension in the sense that uh, it is engaged the presentation in a kind of conceptual history of dictatorship, but I'm more interested uh, in um, uh, identifying uh, the underlying political logic uh, of this, uh, on the one hand, uh, institution uh, in the Roman sense, but also as a political discourse and as a political practice. Now, we all know that uh, dictatorship has a very long history and uh, many claims are made about uh, discontinuities and transformations um, in the concept, in the discourses, in the theories and practices of uh, dictatorship, especially around the transformations that happen around the, the end of the 18th and throughout the 19th century to the degree that uh, it has been claimed that uh, the concept, uh, the idea of dictatorship of the 20th century has completely uh, detached itself uh, from uh, its long uh, ancient uh, uh, Renaissance and early modern uh, history. So what I will try to do is uh, to give a different account uh, of uh, dictatorship in the sense that I will emphasize a continuity of the concept uh, rather than uh, uh, focusing uh, on the changes uh, that uh, have happened uh, in the transition from the classical to the modern idea of uh, dictatorship. And I will do that uh, in order uh, precisely to emphasize uh, its underlying uh, 
a continuous political uh, logic. And uh, in this logic, as I will present it, the logic of dictatorship, uh, some uh, relevance um, might be established with uh, uh, issues pertaining uh, to the problem of uh, authoritarianism and its uh, different forms. But as I said, uh, the presentation is mainly focusing um, on the logic and the conceptual history of uh, dictatorship. So um, I start uh, with uh, a quote uh, by Vladimir Lenin that uh, he wrote almost a century ago. So I quote Lenin, a dictatorship is a big word and big words should not be thrown about carelessly. Uh, now, Lenin might have been wrong on many things, as we know, but he was certainly right in this case. A dictatorship is indeed a big word, uh, or to be more precise, a master concept, a concept with a pivotal, almost continuing presence in political thought, with a long, elaborate history from its ancient origins in Republican Rome up to the last century and beyond. This enduring decisive presence is manifested by its multiple historical trajectories, its uh, nearly global uh, geographical dispersion, its broad political diffusion, its various ideological appropriations that spread to the, extreme, to the extremes of the modern political divide between left and right with some momentous effects, all the while exercising a formative influence on the constitutional structure of the liberal representative state so much so that even a moderate and sober figure like John Stuart Mill declared that, and I quote, I'm far from condemning in cases of extreme exigency, the assumption of absolute power in the form of a temporary dictatorship. Free nations have in old conferred such power by their own choice as a necessary medicine for diseases of the body politic, which could not be got rid of by less violent means. Now, this uh, central lasting presence of dictatorship in the history of uh, political theory and uh, political uh, practice invites three main claims. So these are my three broader claims that uh, uh, form shape uh, the presentation today. First, there is a historical and conceptual co-evolution co of dictatorship and republicanism. The clear correlation between this concept and the republican political imaginary is indicated by the fact that the former was invented and incubated within the latter, the latter and rose and evolved along uh, and in causal connection with it. Dictatorship is a creation and, a, and, a, and an effect of republicanism, both ancient and modern, or to put it more forcefully, it is constitutive of republicanism to the degree that it provides its condition of possibility. And I will say more about this um, uh, in this presentation. And so, as dictatorship is intrinsic to and co-original with republicanism, it must be recognized and treated as a thoroughly republican concept. So this is my first claim that, that dictatorship is a republican concept, not a democratic one, not a monarchical one, not an aristocratic one, and not a liberal one, but a purely republican concept. Second, and uh, contrary to some very well-known accounts uh, that emphasize a rapture, and the shift in the long conceptual history of dictatorships, accounts strongly influenced by Carl Schmitt's famous thesis that the modern concept represents a break from its ancient classical formulation uh, between the end of the 18th and the throughout the 19th century, let's say from the French to the Russian revolutions, I argue that dictatorship retains most of its conceptual unity, core meaning and political logic. Notwithstanding certain noticeable transformations and innovations and the shifting normative attitudes associated with the term, let's say from positive to negative, the concept appears remarkable, remarkably resil uh, resilient and consistent over time, surprisingly uniform and stable, defying established, um, uh, established temporal periodization and historical taxonomies. Hence, conceptual resilience is a fundamental property of dictatorship. Finally, and this is the third claim, dictatorship designates a specific political rationality, a distinct technology of power that is a biopolitical paradigm of ruling that introduced and prioritized above all other consideration, the logic of security and safety. The function and objective of power is to protect, 
to protect, defend, and safeguard life. In that, uh, the concept of dictatorship describes an archetypical apparatus of security that took its exemplary and most developed form in the institutions, practices, and discourses of emergency powers that the modern state developed. It is both, uh, as a, pre uh, it is both uh, a prefiguration and a manifestation of a statist imaginary of power. Dictatorship, therefore, describes the hidden kernel of the modern state. It is a statocentric concept. So the, the three claims is that the dictatorship is a republican concept, a resilient concept, and a statocentric concept. So I propose the following definition of the general concept of dictatorship. Dictatorship names a special modality of political power temporarily released from various limits for the purpose of securing preservation and survival during an apparent, real or supposed, urgent and exceptional situation of an existential threat, usually understood in terms of an external war or an internal sedition. Uh, this undoubtedly is a cursory definition, but, but one consisting of four constitutive significations, or what someone might call sedimented determinations, which provide the concept semantic unity, analytical consistency and political singularity. That is uh, the very specificity of uh, the name dictatorship. Actually, all four significations have remained constant in organizing and reproducing its conceptual intelligibility throughout its long history, despite diverse manifestations, actualizations, shifts, and transformations. So I want to very uh, quickly uh, present uh, these four uh, constitutive significations that account uh, for uh, the political logic of dictatorship uh, that, as I argue, uh, remains uh, constant uh, uh, throughout uh, its history. First, uh, there is the central notion of preservation and survival as the supreme finality of politics. The concept of dictatorship describes foremost uh, a politics of preserving something conserving, maintaining, protecting, and defending it against perceived threats of destruction and annihilation. It does not really matter who or what must be preserved and safeguarded. It can be, and it has been, the republic, the people, the nation, the state, the public interest or the common good, rights, natural or otherwise, a class or a race, liberty, even a revolution. All these uh, names refer to something that needs to be protected. What truly matters is that something and its sheer existence are identified as worthy of preserving and thus elevated to a primary and unconditional objective of political power, irrespective of any concrete identity or particular content. Preservation becomes the highest ultimate end of politics from the perspective of dictatorship, an end in and for itself. With dictatorship, politics is reduced to nothing else than salvation and the absolute imperative of survival that prevails over any other principle, value, consideration, norm, or law. The second uh, uh, signification of the concept is that this absolute primacy of preservation demands that power is temporarily relaxed from established controls and instituted, instituted constraints becoming unmixed and un unbound to a certain degree that is detached from anything that could potentially compromise its operations and effectivity, its ability to secure life. A surplus and an excess of power, mostly in the form of an executive and or military command, is recommended as the necessary means for the realization of the final end of preservation. Such a surplus, a presumed departure from laws and legality, sometimes relative departure, sometimes absolute, uh, morality, religion, customary practices, and everyday habits that have to be relativized for the preservation to be achieved. This is the famous principle that necessity, understood as preservation, knows no law, to which the politics of dictatorship gave birth to and uh, affirmed repeatedly throughout its various and multiple formulations. Thirdly, and in addition to the absolute end of preservation and the means of unlimited or unmixed power, there is a third sentimented determination in the form of an exception. Famously and controversially, the problem of dictatorship is the problem of an exception to the extent 
that the concept designates an exception to a norm, an abnormal and extraordinary situation, a threshold, a borderline case, in, in short, a state of emergency. Clearly, the exception is always understood as a momentary case of extreme peril, a crisis of unprecedented urgency, understood existentially as a danger of extinction, a threat to the very order of things. What is specific to dictatorship, therefore, is that its functioning is always exceptional or temporary in relation to established norms, everyday life expectations, and ordinary practices. Finally, dictatorship expresses an ambition and a hope that the exceptional politics of survival can be managed, brought under the control of a juridical arrangement, a rational framework, or a political will, and thus regulated and contained, either by constitutional mechanism, virtuous leaders, vigilant citizens, wise legislators, courageous generals, or a skillful vanguard parties, the promise that defines the horizon of expectations of dictatorship is that the exceptional situation of an existential crisis will be mastered, that is, dealt with and resolved in a rational, organized, and efficient fashion, prudently, with care, so that preservation is secured and the end of survival achieved. There is a radical instrumental logic that informs this aspiration to control and regulate the unpredictable nature of the exception, which reveals the presence of a rational instrumentality and the technical methodology at work in the conceptual structure of dictatorship. So in other words, the political logic of dictatorship is defined by these four determinations or significations. The primacy of preservation and survival, the idea of uh, uh, absolute or unmixed uh, political power, uh, the notion of the exception to the norm, and finally, this instrumental rationality that the exception can be regulated, managed, and defeated. So I will focus now very uh, quickly because uh, uh, the conceptual history is extremely uh, rich to four episodes that uh, are formative uh, in uh, the political logic of dictatorship. The first, of course, is the foundational moment, uh, the creation of dictatorship in ancient Republican Rome. The second has to do with uh, the uh, re renewal and return of dictatorship in early modernity uh, through Renaissance political thought from Machiavelli uh, up to Rousseau uh, and uh, in the works of uh, neo-republican thinkers uh, like uh, James Harrington, uh, Baru Spinoza, uh, Rousseau. Uh, there are others, but I will focus on those, on those uh, figures as uh, quickly as I can. The third episode um, is the debate uh, around the question of sovereignty uh, that uh, uh, was uh, uh, inaugurated by Jean Baudin and that uh, involved uh, Thomas Hobbes, Filmer, Pufedorf, uh, and uh, some other important modern thinkers and that um, uh, aimed to redefine and to explore the relationship between uh, the modern concept of sovereignty and the sovereign state, state sovereignty, and dictatorship, that is uh, uh, the state of exception. And the last episode uh, would be obviously uh, the so-called reinvention of uh, uh, dictatorship in uh, the Soviet experience, and particularly in, in the Bolshevik writings and the Marxist tradition of the dictatorship of the proletariat. The basic idea uh, in this, uh, uh, using these four uh, episodes uh, is to show that uh, the political logic of dictatorship uh, remains constant uh, and continues uh, despite uh, important differences. We might say that the one difference is uh, the, the um, uh, uh, transition uh, from uh, uh, a personalistic concept of dictatorship to a collective one. Uh, the other is uh, the idea that uh, dictatorship uh, was uh, an emergency institution uh, that gradually uh, became transformed into an emergency uh, or crisis uh, regime. Uh, the third uh, is that uh, dictatorship uh, was a restorative uh, uh, mechanism of power uh, and then uh, uh, transformed uh, into a revolutionary uh, constituent one. I will try to show that despite these differences, the underlying political logic and the four constitutive determinations remain constant and therefore 
the concept of dictatorship retains its conceptual um, um, consistency. So I will uh, begin uh, very uh, quickly uh, from the beginnings. All these four sentimental determinations that define the concept of this dictatorship and disclose its political logic are already present in the original ancient Roman invention, the prototype of all modern forms of emergency institution, Roman dictatorship. The absolute primacy of preservation, the necessity of unmixing power, the exception to the norm, and the rational management of a crisis were all brought together for the first time to constitute the Republican concept and the Roman emergency institution of dictatorship. It is with the ancient Romans and the, in the Republican idiom that dictatorship enters the political lexicon. Uh, for Carl Schmitt, it is the wise invention of the Roman Republic, as he uh, noted, and uh, the expression of the splendid political genius of the Roman people, as uh, Clinton Rositer asserted, that dictatorship was uh, created in a particular historical context at the very foundational moment of the birth of the Roman Republic and the abolition of monarchy by a new ruling patrician class, sometimes during the, early, the, the very early years of the Republic, around the turn of the sixth century. Now, one has to take into account the historical context, as it was uh, described by various uh, Roman and Greek historians, and that was a critical time for the newly established but fragile nascent Republican order that was struggling for stability and legitimacy. So the origins of the institution, but also the concept of dictatorship, is situated in this very volatile post-monarchical context at a perilous foundational juncture that means an intense crisis over its survival and identity, internally fractured by civic discord and plebeian unrest, and threatened externally by the aggression of neighborhood, neighbor cities. An effect of a profound and generalized crisis associated with the very foundation of the Roman Republic, dictatorship was from its very beginning designed as an exceptional instrument for exceptional situations. So one has to take into account that the institution of dictatorship, at least since the analyst historians, Roman historians, was situated in a moment of crisis, not only a concept of crisis, it was created in a time of crisis. From a, from a, a formal standpoint, the Roman dictator, as most of you might know, was a temporary commissioned short-term special but legal, legal magistrate with extraordinary powers of command, imperium, intended to defend the city against external wars, uh, that was the dictatura rei regunda cosa, or internal seditions, dictatura seditionis sendante cosa, and justified in the name of the people's safety, salus populus suprema lex. The mode of authorization, appointment, scope, functions, and durations were defined and regulated by public law, the Lex Curiata. For instance, the appointment process was initiated by the Senate. When it had determined that the city was in a grave danger, it would demand from the councils, that is the executive power, to nominate a dictator with absolute powers, meus imperium, for a period lasting as long as the crisis, but never longer than six months, during which the authority of the normal magistrates could either be suspended along with some of the liberties and protections of the citizens, most notably the right to appeal and the tribunician veto, or subordinated to the command of the dictator so that power could be relaxed from the restraints of laws, the mixed constitutions, the checks and balances, and could use any means necessary to defeat the enemy and the existential threat and restore the constitutional order. Overall, as many as 90 dictators have been recorded for a period of four centuries and a half from uh, for, for, um, uh, the period of the, of the Roman Republic. And it was abolished in 44 by Antonius, uh, again, as a response to the uh, dictatorship, uh, uh, the perpetual dictatorship of Caesar. Now, dictatorship in ancient Rome was a, a, more, a much uh, a venerated and praised institution, it enjoyed a legal, political, and symbolic preeminence in the Roman Republic. One reason for this manifest superiority could be the result of two par parallel events occurring at the moment of appointing a dictator. On the one hand, upon appointment in grave emergencies, 
the dictator assumed executive powers far superior than any other magistrate, magistracy, overriding them all, everywhere and all the time. He turned ordinary magistracies in, into subordinates he could force into recognition if um, uh, he wanted. On the other hand, during the emergency, the, re the Republic could suspend legislation and the principle of collegiality transferred most uh, ju judicial power in the dictator's hand who enjoyed unrestricted powers of coercion. Uh, and this uh, uh, preeminent uh, uh, institutional and symbolic uh, uh, position of dictatorship uh, as an institution, but also as a form of power, uh, was um, expressed uh, in the way it affected the constitutional separation between civil and military authority in the Roman uh, Republic. During normal times, uh, there was uh, a clear separation between uh, civil power and military power. The former was exercised within the boundaries of the city and the latter only outside. Uh, but with dictatorship, uh, this distinction was uh, uh, suspended and uh, the military powers of the dictator could now also uh, be introduced into the uh, powers of the city. So dictatorship entailed the suspension of this important separation. And uh, for this reason, for instance, uh, Clinton Rositer used the formulation that uh, during uh, uh, dictatorships, uh, the Roman Republic was converted into an armed camp governed by an independent and irresponsible general. In other words, dictatorship militarized uh, domestic politics and blurred the distinction between the internal and the external. As an extraordinary uh, but legal device for exceptional times of crisis that occurred with the suspension of the law in order to free power from legal constraints, the history and politics of Roman dictatorship represents the most ambitious attempt, at least in the context of ancient politics, to constitutionalize the exception and bring it under the control of law. It identified the Republic's aim to respond legally to unpredictable threats and to propose constitutional remedies to emergency situations. But beneath its formal characteristics and its constitutional principles, and uh, now, notwithstanding inst it, uh, its institutional composition, dictator dictatorship was predict predicated on two essential features. So the first uh, is carefully or was carefully illustrated by the Greek historian of the first century uh, BC, Dionysius of Calcarnassus. He explicitly described this emergency institution. Uh, Dionysius was a contemporary of Livy, and actually their histories uh, intersect in many respects, but also diverge in many others. And I think uh, around the question of dictatorship, there are some interesting similarities and differences. Uh, so Dionysius explicitly describes this emergency institution as an instrument of class politics that aimed at repressing the social struggles of the plebeians, their seditious politics, and their strat strategy of secession. He associates the creation of dictatorship with social conflicts, the balance of power between the contending classes, their strategic reasoning and self-understandings of their socioeconomic uh, demands, and in particular with the political, legal, and democratic advances the poor were making after the abolition of kingship. Now Dionysius does not underplay the role of external threats, but he situates the birth of uh, uh, dictatorship in relation to internal uh, political struggles between plebeians uh, and uh, patricians. Uh, Livy, uh, as well, but to a lesser extent, uh, commented on the political logic and class composition of ancient dictatorship that was deployed in part to safeguard the aristocratic structure of the Republic by quelling uh, the many and the poor to the, to the benefit of the few and the rich. This uh, reading of a dictatorship that associates it with internal political and social conflict uh, and not uh, only purely with external wars was um, uh, revisited by Montesquieu uh, several centuries later uh, when uh, he commented that, uh, and I quote, to defend themselves, uh, the patricians were in the habit of creating a dictator which succeeded admirably well for them, end of quote. Uh, 
This was especially true for the first two centuries of the Roman Republic, which were characterized by a highly polarized society, widespread exclusions, divided by the problem of the debts and land inequality, shaken by plebeian mobilizations, the famous three secessions, and ruled through pat patrician arbitrariness. The Republican birth of dictatorship, the reform, at least for Dionysius uh, uh, and in some accounts for Libya as well, is firmly situated in this fragile post-monarchical context of intense social and political struggles. Dictatorship, in short, originated with class conflict, and this is reflected in its recurrent de depictions as an aristocratic instrument devised to suppress domestic discord and preserve the political and socioeconomic privileges of the ruling classes. So this is the first uh, uh, element characteristic of Roman dictatorship that goes beyond its purely formal institutional or what we might call today constitutional characteristics. But there is a second one. Roman dictatorship expresses a very distinct understanding of political conflict. Both Cicero and Livy described this emergency office as a remedy for the diseases of sedition, secession, and factionalism, which endanger the health and life of the Republican order. Cicero compared sedition to an illness and the seditious city, and I quote, to an invalid when the illness becomes severe, end of quote, in order to claim that situations of intense conflict implore the assistance of one man because a sick man is more advantageously trusted to a single physician, medical. For Cicero, the dictator is like a doctor and dictatorship is a medicine for a collective body in distress and an urgent need of a cure that will secure its preservation and save its life. For as he insisted, and I quote, security prevails over caprice, uh, end of quote. Likewise, Livy compared the, ple the plebeian struggles to, uh, quote, an internal dissension of the body members, intestina corporis sedition, end of quote, and portrayed domestic conflict as a disease of the commonwealth that was not one that could be cured by ordinary, ordinary remedies. And I quote Cicero, just as when a man was sick, any disorder, however slight, was felt more than a worse one will be by a healthy man. So now, when a city, a city was sick and suffering, any untoward occurrence should be gobbed not by its increasing importance, but by the unfeebled condition of the Republic, which could endure aggravation. And so they had recourse to a remedy, the creation of a dictator, end of quote. A manifestation of corruption and degeneration, internal strife was uh, regularly depicted as the symptom of a deeper disorder, a malady, which described an extreme pathological condition that afflicted the collective body of the Republic, threatened its existence, and in urgent need of an exceptional cure that only the Senate could administer by means of a dictatorship. Hence, the polemical quality of the concept and its antagonistic disposition were partly determined in opposition to the endemic tendencies of a republic to stasis and sedition. Accordingly, Dionysius of Alcarnassus evocately redefined dictatorship, and I quote, as a, mel as a medicine for the malady of civil conflict, the hostasian pharmacon, end of quote. Namely, and I quote again, the only remedy for every incurable ill and the last hope of safety when all others have been snatched away by some crisis, end of quote. For, as he recorded from a senatorial debate, the dictator who has been invested with absolute and irresponsible powers will cut off the diseased part of the city and will not permit that which is as yet uninfected to be contaminated, end of quote. So as a pharmacon, Dictatorship introduced a biopolitical language that framed the end of politics to consist of the preservation of life and the making of a healthy collective bodies, corpus republica. In these ancient conceptualizations, the Roman emergency institution appears as an exceptional medicine that removes the disease of antagonism, conflict, and dissension from the city, restores its unity and order, relieves society from division, and protects the body of the Republic from decline, dissolution, and death. Therefore, we can see that uh, for the ancient Romans, 
dictatorship was not only a formal constitutional uh, design institution to protect against external wars, but uh, there was an underlying uh, understanding that uh, any kind of internal conflict, uh, social struggle, a uh, class um, antagonism was considered as a lethal melody that, what, that had to be uh, cured by the institution of dictatorship that was uh, framed as a pharmacon against, uh, hell, uh, against conflict in order to restore the healthy, harmonious, unitary, peaceful order of the constitution. So this is the first episode. Now, I move now to the Renaissance and to the recovery uh, and the renewal uh, of the discourse on dictatorship because during the Middle Ages, the concept almost uh, uh, disappeared. So this biopolitical model of security politics against internal conflict and uh, in order to establish an harmonious, uh, unitary, uh, order originally introduced with the ancient concept by the Romans was uh, first uh, revived and reaffirmed by Niccolo Machiavelli in uh, 1532 in his Reflections on the Roman Republic, where he discussed this emergency office in the context of a general prudential rule on how to cure a disease. One, Machiavelli said, and I quote, always should consider well the strength of the malady, and if you see you have enough to cure it, set yourself at it without hesitation, end of um, quote. This axiom was put into use in his description of the Republican institution as a, a remedy, I quote, a remedy for urgent danger, end of quote, and extraordinary accidents that tend to ruin republics. The Florentine enthousi enthusiastically recommended the cure of dictatorship to the moderns because he claimed as a remedy, it always did good to the city, and praised it as one of the most uh, of the main causes of Rome's greatness. In fact, the centrality that dictatorship attained in the modern lexicon, from James Harrington, Algernon Sidney to Baruch Spinoza and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, is primarily due to Machiavelli and his neo-republican resurrection and vindication of the ancient emergency institution. Now, Machiavelli's appropriation defense and diffusion of dictatorship had an innovative aspect. So here we have the first, uh, let's say, modern innovation that comes to supplement uh, the ancient classical concept. While he emphasized its constitutional dimension and recognized its increasing bond with the mixed regime and its complex and slow institutional structure that prevents it from responding quickly and efficiently, efficiently to unpredictable threats and extraordinary accidents, he put forward a new argument by associating the imperative of existential preservation with the strategy of imperial expansion, so that by increasing in size, a republic overcomes the natural tendencies of corruption and decline. In the absence of dictatorship, he asserted, the republic will have remained small and weak because either its external enemies will have defeated it or it will have ruined itself by, falling, by failing to redirect its internal conflicts outwards through constitutional channels. In other words, uh, uh, Machiavelli did not only resurrect or imitate the ancient concept of dictatorship, but he introduced a, a new dialectics of preservation that integrates the, 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 the dynamics of domestic discords with the politics of imperial enlargement mediated by the institution of dictatorship. So he linked the dictatorship with imperial expansion, something that was not um, clear, theorized, or obvious for the ancients. For, he argued, republics without uh, dictatorship necessarily perish. Simply put, and I quote, those republics that uh, in urgent dangers do not take refuge either in the dictator or in a similar authorities will always come to ruin in grave accidents, end of quote. With this rigorous reasoning and general claim, he asserted that the concept of dictatorship is intrinsic to the Republican political tradition and an and, and, and indispensable component of the Roman legacy, thus elevating to a constitutive, political, institutional, and normative future of modern republicanism. This pivotal position of dictatorship as uh, the condition of possibility of uh, modern republicanism was upheld and further asserted by later Republican thinkers, Harrington, Spinoza, and Rousseau, who following in uh, Machiavelli's footsteps, 
confirmed its centrality for the modern republic with a very similar political logic that assigned an absolute unconditional priority to, sure, to sheer survival and self-preservation. Tellingly, in this, in his incomplete post-Hobbesian political treatise, Spinoza directly associated the idea of the best regime form with the imperative of security. As he force, forcefully put it, the highest aim of society, and I quote, the purpose of civil order is not a, or nothing or other than peace and security of life, end of quote, to add that, quote, for a civil order that has not removed away the causes of seditions is little different from the mere state of nature where every man lives as he pleases with his life at risk, end of quote. Spinoza's reflection on dictatorship were developed within his broader realist post-Hobbesian framework defined by the, the supreme end of a secure life and were meant to address as a matter of the greatest importance, that is when no provision has been made against this danger, that is the danger of conflict, the state will not be able to endure by its own strength, but only by good fortune. Within this context, dictatorship is introduced, as I quote, and I quote now Spinoza, as a proper remedy applied to counter the evil of the dissolution of government and the collapse of the state. End of quote. And its importance is measured according to, to its ability to securing self preservation. Now, this view departs at least in one crucial respect from Machiavelli's theories of dictatorship. And uh, this is what brings also uh, Harrington and Spinoza uh, to play a very important role in introducing uh, a new element in addition to the, ones, uh, to the one that was introduced by Machiavelli. While the Florentine praised uh, the Roman institution and saw no flaws whatsoever in its ancient design, both Harrington and Spinoza disliked its strong personalistic dimension and worked against the monarchic character of the dictator's command. And I quote Spinoza, since this dictatorial power is an, in essence regal, the state cannot occasionally turn into a monarchy, even for ever so short a time, within, without endangering its republican institution. Constitution, end of quote. Echoing um, similar concerns by Harrington, who had addressed this problem with his idea of a dictator Oceana, Spinoza proposed as a proper remedy for the safety and the, um, preservation of the Republic, a revised and modified version of dictatorship, an improved model of emergency power with an additional line of defense against the autocratic nature of the ancient type, depersonalization. Like uh, uh, Harrington, he introduced the idea of dictatorship as uh, the power of a council. In other words, uh, he depersonalized and uh, created uh, the idea, uh, proposed the idea of a collective body that will uh, be invested with dictatorial powers. Uh, he called it uh, the Council of Syndics, primarily collective and plural in composition and perpetual in tenure. Um, in which with, and I quote, with this in view that the sword of the dictator should be permanently in the hands, not of any natural person, but of a civil body whose members will be too many to make it possible to divide among themselves command of the state or to conspire together in any crime, end of, of quote. This collective dictatorship was assigned with the key tasks of countering the evil of disintegration, suppressing weakness, eradicating vices, responding to grave emergencies and existential crises, restoring unity, harmony, security, and peace, and ultimately per preserving the form of the Republican state. So the first innovation, both of Harrington and uh, Spinoza, is that they move from a personalistic to a collective form of dictatorship. So that is important to keep in note because uh, the idea of collective dictatorship does not emerge in the 19th century or in the end of the 18th century, but it's already in, uh, mentioned in the 17th one. With this recommendation, Harrington and Spinoza elaborated a proto-theory of an emergency government taking the concept of dictatorship to a new level of theoretical and institutional sophistication, which became formative for subsequent theories, anticipating thus the idea of a Christ cabinet. Spinoza in particular alluded even 
to a new role for this collective emergency body, and this is his second innovation, when he attributed to dictatorship of the syndics the power and the responsibility to bring the republic back to its first beginnings, to its original foundations, and to restore it to its initial principles. Now, perhaps for the first time, the concept of dictatorship acquired a meaning of refoundation and became a force that revisits the founding moment of the Republic and thus a force of reform. Uh, that is, uh, um, with Spinoza, the idea of dictatorship starts uh, moving toward the idea of uh, a constituent power. And yet, despite these two important innovations, uh, the revised version remained firmly situated within uh, the classical Repub Republican tradition, as all four sentimental determinations that defined ancient dictatorship remained intact and retained their centrality. The absolute primacy of survival and self-preservation, the necessity of concentrating and centralizing power beyond ordinary limits, the exception to the norm, and the rational legal management of an emergency or a crisis. They are all operative, for example, in Spinoza's distinction, uh, discussion of the dictatorial prerogatives of the Council of Syndics. And uh, of course, in 1762, we have uh, the ambitious and influential rewriting of republicanism by Rousseau, who affirmed also all the four determinations of dictatorship and asserted its indispensable place in a free republic. He strengthened he strengthened its basis of justification but reiter by reiterating the absolute prima primacy of safety and salvation by endorsing the principle, and I state, that the state shall not perish, end of quote, as a highest overriding political value. The justification rested on this anatomical and biopolitical understanding of political community, I quote Rousseau. The body politic, just like the body of a man, because be, begins to die as soon as it, is, as it is born and carries within itself the causes of its destruction. It is not within men's capacity to prolong their life. It is within their capacity to prolong the state's life as far as possible by giving it the best constitution it can have." End of quote. In summarizing his political project, he added, I quote, by the social pact, we have given the body politic existence and life. The task now is to give it motion and will by legislation. For the initial act by which this body examines, assumes form and unity, still leaves entirely undetermined what it must do to preserve itself." End of quote. This fond foundational task of politics, defined in terms of an absolute commitment to the preservation and protection of the body politic, is once again predicated on the priority of the exception of the, over the norm that is security over liberty, and especially as he emphatically put it, and I quote, in times of pressing uh, peril, when there are rare and manifest cases, circumstances of the greatest dangers, we can lead to the ruin and of the state uh, in a crisis, and of quote, a dictatorship is uh, necessary. When such exceptional cases of existential threat occur, the inflexibility, generality, and formality of established laws with their slow pace become an obstacle that will destroy the body politic of the Republican state. Laws are, that are instituted for, more, for more normal times prove to be dangerous impediments to the effective protection of the state. Hence, the rule of law is sacred, who so famously pre preached, and I quote, except when the salvation of the fatherland is at stake, end of quote. Once again, for republicanism, considerations of self-preservation trump the principles of equal, equal autonomy and the rule of law, since, uh, I quote Rousseau, there are extreme evils that render violent remedies necessary, end of quote. Dictatorship is the ultimate and foremost violent remedy to any serious threat confronting the very existence and unity of the republic. What the reform the dictator has to do, to only do during critical times, is to defend the life of the body politic in all possible ways and by any means necessary. So this is uh, the idea of uh, the salut public, uh, of public safety that uh, from uh, Rousseau traveled to the French Revolution and from the, Re the French Revolution uh, to the um, um, Jacobin uh, um, uh, Committee of Public Safety.
Uh, and now finally, uh, to the, not finally, although I have to uh, accelerate, to the third episode. Uh, the third episode uh, is uh, somehow different because it tries uh, to establish uh, the uh, terms of a dialogue or a dialectical relationship between uh, a modern sovereignty and uh, the concept of dictatorship. The intimate affinity between the Republican emergency institution and the principle of self-preservation during exceptional times of crisis sparked an intense debate in the 16th and 17th century on the entwinements of monarchy, sovereignty, and dictatorship, and about the ultimate ends of politics as such. Uh, it was a debate with some momentous implications for the rise of the modern theory of the state, its philosophical foundations, and its biopolitical apparatus of security. This important but largely forgotten dispute initiated by Jean Baudin involved, among others, Hugo Grossius, Robert Filmer, Thomas Hobbes, and Samuel Pufedov. Briefly stated, this debate revolved around a crucial question Baudin had raised in 1576 about the monarchical character of dictatorship that, as we saw, uh, became a, a central concern for Harrington and also Spinoza, and uh, the temporary manifestation of kingship in a Republican government during an emergency uh, that already many several historians had acknowledged. So while discussing the comparative weaknesses and merits of the three canonical regime types, Baudin put aside his well-known distinction between sovereignty and commission to draw, to draw attention to a striking similarity between dictatorship and monarchy. By appointing a dictator whom he defined as a, and I quote, magistrate who had absolute power for a limited time to dispose of all the affairs of the Commonwealth, end of quote, and although a delegated magis magistracy, a commission, the Romans inadvertently admitted, according to Baudin, and I quote, that an absolute power united in one person is more eminent and of greater effect and at the same time, and uh, that the same power imparted to two, three, or many lords or to a whole community declines and uh, loses its force. End of quote. So for uh, Baudin, this appeal to the absolute power of the one in times of crisis uh, provided him with the conceptual resources to rethink the authority of the Roman dictator, who, even if he was appointed by the mandate of a superior, the uh, sovereign monarch, and limited by an expiration date, he still enjoyed the temporary possession of an absolute command whenever the Republic was facing threats to its self-preservation. In so arguing, he exposed the king's presence inside the Roman emergency office. Whereas most ancient and modern Republican thinkers were well aware of this presence, yet not particularly per perturbed or puzzled by it, with the exception of Harrington and Spinoza, Baudin was the first of the moderns to have initially pulled the threat of dictatorship until it unraveled the entire constitutional fabric of the Republican mixed constitution with its checks and balances, laying bare its veiled monarchical core. By reinterpreting dictatorship as an attenuated expression of regal power, and I quote, absolute power for limited time, end of quote, he inferred that whenever a city rushes frightened for protection to a dictator, it, fall, it falls back to a king, and consequently, it admits the necessary superiority of monarchy over a republican constitution. But if that is the case, Grotius reasoned half a, a, a century later by radicalizing Baudin's polemical interpretation, uh, it uh, must follow that the attributes that dictatorship and monarchy share in common originate from the same source of sovereign power. And this is the important moment where um, Grotius will try to uh, mix and to fuse the concept of dictatorship with the concept of sovereignty. He went a step further to maintain that the Roman dictator was not solely, and I quote, a sort of temporary monarch, uh, end of quote, but primarily, and I quote, a temporary sovereign, end of quote. For Grotius, the dictator enjoyed, and I, call, and I quote, real sovereignty for a time, end of quote. And although he, rec he recognized the commissarial na nature of dictatorship that deprived it of its perpetual quality of sovereignty, he retorted that it still retains the defining attributes of indivisibility, 
as long as it is not subject to appeal, and of supremacy as all of their office, offices remain subordinate to its superior authority. He emphasized that for a limited period of its duration, dictatorship could, could result to all the acts of sovereignty. Namely, the dictator possessed the same powers and had the same effects as the sovereign, that is, and I quote, I quote, his acts are not subjects to another power so that they cannot be made void by any other human will, end of quote. While in office, the Roman dictator ruled and commanded without consulting anyone of being accountable for his conduct above the people and no more dependent on them during the time fixed than a priest established for life. So he, ended, he, he argued that uh, uh, he redefined the dictatorship as limit, at sovereignty limited by time. And therefore, he confidently asserted that by, and I quote, a temporary right, dictatorship possessed for a time as much authority as the most absolute king. Thus, he concluded, and I quote, among the Romans, the dictator was sovereign for a time, end of quote. This reinterpretation of dictatorship as a time-limited sovereignty, that is an expression of sovereign power for exceptional times of, of crisis, had some far-reaching implications. The description of the Republican concept of emergency as temporary sovereignty suggests likewise that sovereignty is a perpetual dictatorship. Hence, by defining dictatorship in, in terms of sovereignty, Grotius made possible the definition of state sovereignty in terms of dictatorship. This reciprocal definitional relationship blurred the two concepts in a way that it shaped the theory of the modern state in the language of an absolute command as the only effective means for permanently securing preservation, repressing disorder, and protecting life against the ever-present possibility of conflict and war, depicted often, but not exclusively, as a normless state of nature, that is, as a permanent state of exception. The modern of state sovereignty, therefore, came to be defined according to the logic of dictatorship and the paradigm of security. As such, this early modern debate on sovereignty and dictatorship is enorm enormously instructive for a number of related reasons. First, it illustrates how, with the development and modern diffusion of republicanism, the Roman the concept of dictatorship have a decisive influence on the form and content of politics, of modern politics, to the degree that the principle of state sovereignty, its ground of justification, was explicitly defined as a, a form, a salus populus suprema lex. In other words, the principle that defined ancient dictatorship was uh, um, re redeployed to define the, the legitimacy of the modern state, of the modern absolute state. Second, it exemplifies the genealogy of biopolitical power from antiquity to modernity through the discourses of dictatorship and the primacy of security and preservation, that is the, superior, the superiority of securing life, which became formalized as, and I quote, a right of security. This right of security famously is theorized by Vattel uh, in his theory of uh, international law, that all state possess by natural right and entice them to do whatever is necessary to preserve themselves fr from threats and uh, injuries, both internal and external, domestic and, for, uh, and uh, foreign. So the modern state is understood to be entitled to a right to security on, uh, against internal war, external war, and internal sedition. It reveals, third, it reveals how underlying assumptions and objectives uh, that framed the problem of the modern state uh, sovereignty were de derived from and depended on the political logic of dictatorship. The philosophy of the modern state was elaborated in terms of the Roman emergency institution, whereby politics is reduced in the final instance to the mere realization of a same, safe and secure life and to the underlying natural right to self-preservation, especially when faced with conflict, war, and an and, and ever-present violence often conceived as a violation of this natural right uh, of uh, secure life. In fact, the modern theory of the state form is an elaborate reworking and reconstruction of the four sentimented determinations and constitutive significations that have organized over time the conceptual intelligibility of dictatorship. In this sense, the modern state appears 
as an amplified simulacrum and an enlarged copy of a Republican state of emergency. In that tradition, the modern state is simply a permanent dictatorship. The fourth uh, uh, episode that I'm not going um, to discuss much because we don't have time is uh, the relationship between uh, uh, dictatorship and uh, revolution, that is uh, the transition to a theory of revolutionary dictatorship uh, that happens uh, occurs during the French Revolution. The main figures here are Jean-Paul Marat, Saint-Just, but later on, Babeuf and the conspiracy of the equals, Marx, Engels, finally Lenin and the Bolsheviks. What do we have in this first episode is what we might call the revolutionary, the revolutionary contamination with the logic of dictatorship. The doctrine of the dictatorship of the proletariats that the Bolsheviks formulated and implemented around the time of the October Revolution finds its origin in ancient Rome and its political logic can be traced in the evolving Republican model of the state of emergency. This continuity, for instance, is indicated in a remarkable passage from one of the many speeches Lenin gave during the celebrations of the first anniversary of the revolution in November 1918. I'm quoting Lenin. It is clear that this past year has been one of genuine proletarian dictatorship. This concept used to be mysterious book Latin, a mouthful of incomprehensible words, in that um, could not, uh, this concept, I'm sorry, this concept used to be a mysterious book Latin, a mouthful of incom incomprehensible words. Intellectuals sought an explanation of the concept in learned books, which only gave them a hazy notion of what the proletarian dictatorship was all about. The chief thing that stands to our credit during this past year is that we have translated these words from abstru abstruse Latin into plain Russian. During the past year, the working class has not been engaged in idle philosophizing, but in the practical work of creating and exercising a proletarian di dictatorship, despite the, existent, ex the excited mental state of the intellectuals." End of quote. This passage is remarkable for several reasons. First, it describes the main achievement of the first year of the Bolshevik revolution in terms of the dictatorship of the proletariat. This concept epitomizes the world historical significance of the revolution and is acknowledged as an essential component of the Bolshevik party. Second, it deliberately locates the proletarian dictatorship all the way back to its Latin origins and Roman history. Third, the obscure and imprecise meaning of the concept, its forgotten truth, hidden and distorted by scholarly books, is finally revealed and disclosed in the concrete political activities of the Bolsheviks and the working class. And fourth, through this revolutionary activity, a new practical form of dictatorship is proposed, an improved and higher version that claims to have perfected and thus to have surpassed the ancient original, original republican uh, model. Any attempt to explore the critical implications of Lenin's statements for the broader political and conceptual trajectory of dictatorship must necessarily begin with this ambitious Bolshevik act of translation. For one thing, as a translation of the Roman concept, the doctrine of proletarian dictatorship fully shares the former's obsession with self-preservation and survival, accords a similar primacy to absolute power during ex uh, exceptional moments of an existential crisis, describes an exception to the, to the norm, and expresses a like commitment to instrumental rationality and a utilitarian logic. When treated as an offspring of republicanism, the Bolshevik appropriation of the Roman model of emergency politics appears to inaugurate one of its latest, more formative, eventful, and most tragic episodes in its long conceptual and political history. What is of special relevance, therefore, is an understanding of how and in what ways the concept of dictatorship was theorized, enacted, and reimagined by the Bolshevik revolutionary theory and practice. How, in other words, dictatorship and revolution became intertwined and mixed, their distinctions blurred and fused in the process of a translation whereby a Republican patrician emergency institution provided the conceptual resources, semantic language, and political means to think of modern plebeian revolutions. For one, this encounter invites the question 
of how the two concepts because became associated in the first place and what this encounter reveals about dictatorship, its history and politics, its effects and legacies. Furthermore, what impact this emergence model had on the modern revolutionary experience, its actualization and unfolding, its accomplishments, contradictions and failures? How did it shape the bullshit vision of insurrectional practice and revolutionary politics? What, in short, are the broader consequences of the Bolshevik thesis that dictatorship is the necessary condition for revolutionary politics? Now, the basic, uh, in order to conclude, uh, the basic um, uh, argument when it comes to the uh, Bolshevik appropriation of the Republican uh, concept of dictatorship is that uh, the revolution uh, became um, uh, reduced uh, to a state of emergency rather than being understood as um, a horizon of emancipation. As a Bolshevik work of translation, the idiom of a revolutionary proletarian dictatorship inscribed the political logic of the Republican emergency model with its four sed sedimented determination in the emancipatory ideal of a social revolution that set out the promise of abolishing from human history class domination and economic exploitation. In other words, the Bolsheviks reduced the idea of an emancipatory revolution to a state of emergency. With this Republican inscription, the revolutionary project of social emancip emancipation came to occupy a normless zone of emergency, an ab abnormal state of exception, defined by the existential conflict between two hostile social classes, a total war for supremacy, survival, and ultimately for life itself. I'm going to end this uh, by going back to, this is what I call the securitization of revolutionary politics, by going back uh, to uh, Plekhanov, who introduced uh, in uh, 1905 into the Social Democratic Workers' Parties of Russia, uh, the principle salus revolution, revolutionis suprema lex. So uh, Plekhanov argued that the dictatorship of the proletariat should be predicated on the principle of salus revolutionary suprema lex, that is uh, the safety or salvation of the revolution is the supreme law that uh, um, overrides all other, any other consideration. So to conclude now, the long history of dictatorship paints a disquieting and disturbing image of politics, a politics that periodically has recourse to enhance centralized executive powers and military means, an apparatus of security that subordinates freedoms and protections to safety, survival, harmony, unity, and order. For according to the logic of dictatorship, it is in the final instance, the imperative of sheer existence that must be defended and protected at any cost, which determines the content, meaning, and end of politics. This biopolitical logic of dictatorship in its various contents, forms, and incarnations from left to right has been keen to stress the primacy of preservation and mere life over liberty, that is to reduce power to the extreme exigencies of fear and insecurities. Dictatorship invokes the specters of disorder, violence, and extinction as ever-present possibilities of the political. It radically, it, its radically instrumental and utilitarian logic is predicated on and just justified by a politics of fear that mobilizes anxieties of survival and self-preservation when faced with conflict, dissension, crisis, and emergencies. This enduring Republican presence of dictatorship in theory and practice in the left and the right keeps undermining popular demands for a free life that democracy strives to embody and enact. So I will end uh, here and thank you for your patience because I spoke uh, for 70 minutes. That's no problem. We are very appreciative, uh, Andreas. Uh, and I personally, certainly, for bringing in uh, political theory uh, into our topic, uh, though, of course, uh, you didn't quite bring it into our topic. And so I'd like to just make a couple of uh, remarks, uh, which might mediate a bit. Uh, first, uh, uh, you are Greek, uh, but it's very interesting how you only talk about the Romans. Now, I happen to know privately that you have views about this. <laughs> 
uh, and it has to do with the superiority of democracy to the Republic. In other words, the superiority of the Athenian institutions uh, to the Roman ones. Now, neglecting that today, uh, given that we're talking about populism in the seminar, at least, has some consequences. Uh, because after all, uh, people here will know that uh, the Socratic philosophers have almost the opposite view on Greek democracy than you do. Uh, in other words, for them, Greek democracy produces tyranny, uh, or at least uh, uh, has a, a very strong logic uh, in that uh, direction. So if the question is the legalization of tyranny, why not talk about democracy and tyranny also, uh, especially uh, since uh, in, in uh, our topic here, namely populism, uh, links uh, one version of the democratic imaginary uh, to authoritarian uh, consequences. So that's the first uh, remark I wanted to make. The second remark I want to make is that you don't really do yourself too great a favor by bringing in the theory of the modern state. Uh, uh, it is a brilliant conception, of course, that if you just take the concept of sovereignty abstractly, it is the application of dictatorship to something more permanent uh, uh, to the modern state. So that's your innovation, and I, I grant it, it's, it's extremely interesting. And nevertheless, it gives us something like a half or a third of the history of the modern state. Uh, you know, your selective use of the, uh, uh, of the uh, intellectual sources of the period indicates that because although you mentioned Montesquieu, you do not really talk about separation of powers. Uh, you don't really talk about Locke. You don't talk about Paine. You don't talk about the constitutionalists and the liberals. I know you don't like them. That's not much of a reason, though, for not mentioning them when you imply that their creation is simply dictatorship because they altered the concept of dictatorship in some other way than you suggested, namely to bring in separation of powers into the state, bring in liberal limits. And why do they then need to have, in addition, this is a question to you, a dictatorship institution in many of these cases, because of the non-identity of the state that they have created and dictatorship. Because why would you need an emergency institution anyway? Stalin didn't write into his constitution emergency uh, rules, why the hell did he have to? Since the whole thing, as you correctly say, was a permanent uh, emergency rule. So I think that uh, in a way uh, uh, you uh, uh, leave out half the ancient history, namely Greece. Now I know your views on that, but those views should be, uh, uh, should be open to challenge. And then secondly, you leave out this half of the history of the modern state which is also, among other things, a history of its, of its limitation, a history of its uh, limitation. I think you're right about the Bolsheviks. You're right about the Bolsheviks. But where that is relevant to the course and to our discussion is that for the Bolsheviks, it's not republicanism uh, that uh, is the normative foundation uh, for, uh, uh, for the permanentization of dictatorship. It is exactly democracy. Uh, they constantly talk about it as the most democratic order in history. Uh, Marx already dictatorship democracy, a dictatorship proletariat implied this, and, and the Bolsheviks constantly repeat it. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, the linkage of democracy and dictatorship, which you omit in this discussion, comes back even more dramatically in your third stage. Your yeah. questions are um, uh, exceptionally important. Uh, they, they point at the very core of uh, what I'm trying to do with this uh, study on dictatorship. And uh, uh, certainly they point also at um, uh, dimensions of the, of the argument uh, that I tried to, to present that um, I, I didn't really touch on. So the question is about uh, uh, democracy and republicanism as two different political um, uh, imaginaries. <coughs> I'm sorry, and how uh, my story of uh, Greek democracy does not touch on the question of tyranny that might be relevant in discussions about populism uh, today. Uh, certainly, uh, one has to take into account uh, that uh, the so-called uh, Greek philosophers uh, in their anti-democratic uh, fury were completely mistaken. 
democracy is a, is a response to tyranny. There are no tyrannies emerging out of democracies, at least empirically in antiquity. What about Pisistratus? Pisistratus for one. It was before democracy. Democracy was uh, uh, when the oh, PC. Well. Oh, when the, well. uh, the, 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 the foundation of democracy is uh, seven or, uh, 507 BC, after Pisistratus, especially the crimes of his son and uh, the anti tyrannical uh, revolt uh, that ensued. But that, uh, let's not uh, focus only on uh, uh, empirics because the, the empirics can be completely uh, accidental. Democracy instituted uh, three laws against tyranny because the Athenian democracy was aware how demagogues uh, might turn into tyrants. So they instituted uh, the tyrannicide laws uh, publicly uh, that uh, were, I think, one of the most important lines of defense along with ostracism against the uh, tyrannical uh, possibilities uh, uh, emerging from within democracy. So there was a kind of self-awareness that uh, the rise of demagogues uh, uh, might overthrow the democratic uh, gains uh, uh, of the many, and uh, they, they created institutional device. In the Roman Republic, what they did was uh, the opposite. In moments of crisis, in a sense, uh, they instituted a kind of legal tyrant, uh, the, the dictator, to uh, save them uh, from uh, external or internal threats. So uh, I think uh, there is a difference, and they were um, uh, never so much concerned against tyranny until the first century BC uh, with the uh, experiences of Sulla and, um, and Caesar. But what I want to say is that, um, again, with the question of populism, I don't know how much relevant it is. I don't think that in a direct assemblies or more or less direct assemblies, uh, populism can become a problem. Usually populism is associated with uh, issues of representation mediated by elections uh, rather than direct participation. So that's uh, one way to address, but certainly uh, in the book manuscript, um, I, I try to, I have a chapter on the, uh, on how a dem a ancient democracy dealt with emergencies and how the Romans dealt with emergencies, just to um, uh, clarify these uh, important uh, aspects. Now, the second point again uh, that you raise uh, is extremely important because uh, I do, uh, in my presentation here, I emphasize only uh, the uh, theory, the philo political philosophy of the absolute state uh, from Baudin, Hobbes, Pufedorf. So the emphasis is on, the on, the, on this foundational discourse of the state. It is true that uh, with Montesquieu, Locke, uh, and uh, the later constitutionalist, con con constitutionalist, there is an attempt now uh, to circumvent institutionally to control uh, uh, these powers of the state. But by my argument will be along the following lines, by constitutionalizing uh, or trying to, constitution to, to constitutionally limit the dictatorial uh, 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 aspects of the modern state, uh, they, fall, uh, they fall into the trap of constitutional dictatorship. In other words, constitutional dictatorship reveals that in moments of exception, the true nature of the modern state is dictatorial. In, in, in that sense, it is based on the primacy of security, executive power over moments of crisis and emergencies. The, so um, here I think I sign uh, I follow a little bit Schmidt, not completely, to say that modern sovereignty uh, reveals uh, the dictatorial nature of the modern state in, ext in extreme borderline cases. Uh, in normal times, uh, the state is indeed constitution, that is, uh, the dictatorial uh, core uh, remains uh, dormant uh, and uh, a bit uh, concealed. But in moments of crisis, uh, we know that the modern state has uh, a, a tremendous uh, uh, apparatus uh, of security and the biopolitical uh, logic uh, that can be mobilized any time it, uh, it, is, um, it, 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 is, it, it, it considers that uh, it is facing uh, a kind of uh, existential crisis. So self-preservation, concentration of powers, uh, the idea of uh, rational instrumentality and uh, the uh, exception to the, to the norm remain uh, uh, central foundational principles of the modern state in institution. That's, uh, that is the argument, but here you are right, uh, I presented only half of the story. Uh, the Bolsheviks is true, they develop, uh, I think they develop a theory of the dual state, uh, democracy for the proletarians, dictatorship for the bourgeoisie. In other words, they try to do the impossible, to bring democracy and dictatorship together. Uh, that was, I think, uh, the Bolshevik fantasy. Uh, and it was an impossible one, and ultimately 
democracy, the, the democracy of the of the of the proletarian was completely eradicated, uh, and uh, the dictatorship against the bourgeoisie. Uh, won over. In other words, the security state of the Bolsheviks uh, destroyed uh, the council or the Soviet uh, democracy uh, that they tried to institute. So um, that, was, uh, that was part of the, the last uh, uh, section of my paper on the Bolshevik dictatorship that I didn't include here today. But here you are absolutely right that these two elements, dictatorship and democracy, cannot coexist. At the end, the democracy will, uh, will be defeated uh, by dictatorship. And I think this is what happened with the Bolsheviks. The Soviets uh, disappeared, uh, but the dictatorial apparatus uh, uh, remained in force. So the idea of the dual state ultimately turned into a singular dictatorial state. Thanks a lot. Now I can actually see little hands uh, on my screen. A blue hand appears. It's really wonderful. I don't see all the faces, but I see a blue hand. And this particular blue hand belongs to Jean Cohen. So I call on her. Hi, Andreas. Um, Hi. Yeah, no, I think it was a very good, very good talk. And I appreciate what you're trying to do. Um, since Andrew asked so many questions, at one point I thought that I, I'm left with none and everybody else was left with none, but I still have some. So as you know, of course, um, just, this is not the main point, but just with respect to revolution, of course, Hannah Arendt, as you know, was concerned revolution freedom. She blamed the social question and its emergence, precisely what you, what, um, uh, and you blame dictatorship, yes. um, but in any case, that's fine. Uh, but both of these blamings seems to cover over a, a deeper question. And that is the relationship between revolution and authoritarianism or revolution and autocracy, if you don't want to use the word dictatorship. There might be a trajectory that, that's papered over with, with all this blaming. The other thing um, is, I mean, the more important thing that I wanted to raise was um, in a way, uh, what you're doing is um, telling us about the underside of republicanism, right? Um, but of course, you know, Lefort, there's an underside to the underside and Andrew was trying to articulate that. Um, meaning limits, separation of powers, um, or we could say not, in, you don't have to frame that in a liberal way, you could frame it in terms of counter powers. I thought Machiavelli also wanted to bring in conflict into the, or actually into the state apparatus, but we don't have to go to Machiavelli. Okay, so the underside of the underside, which comes up to, to us, you know, through to us, uh, to this day would be what we could say the positive dimensions or aspects of republicanism that are precisely not identical to dictatorship and of which dictatorship is not the truth, it's a contradiction. But I wanted to ask you about a similar dynamic with democracy, which would also link this to um, what, we, what has been discussed in the seminar and what Andrew and I discussed in our book and many other people about um, populism and democracy or another way to put it is doesn't, um, is, aren't there multiple um, uh, uh, dynamics or possibilities inherent in democracy also? Meaning that, um, of course, we know what the good stuff is. I mean, we pretend to know institutionally, that's not so obvious. I don't think you can ever avoid representation, certainly not in the council system. From the minute you move from the first council, we're talking representation. But anyway, um, that the dynamic of democracy itself opens it up always um, to, well, I mean, Schmidt made the link, democracy and dictatorship, that was his argument. We're talking about unity, the people, finding them, their will, their voice, the whole thing. That's Rousseau, Rousseau is, is just as much a Democrat as a, Demo as a, as a Republican. So, um, so I think that there's a, it's not inexorable dynamics, it's not the truth of democracy, democracy isn't tyranny, but um, these things have, are dualistic. They have multiple possibilities, dynamics, and um, I think that we should see uh, the underside of democracy, not that, but I also go for the underside of the underside, etc. I think you get the point. Yes, okay, no, no. So, yeah, so after that very short Did he, question, could he answer? Could no, he answer? no, I, I'm going to call. Oh, you want other questions? Else. Okay, fine. Uh, yeah, I'd like to call on Emmanuel Garisoli. Um, thank you, Andreas, and it's good to see that uh, you're also alive like the rest of us uh, after this year. I wanted to, so I, I this is an argument that we all have had, and I think it's fantastic that uh, we are continuing on that trend. I have to, in a way, uh, piggyback on Andrew's and Jean's point, but in a different perspective, and you know probably where I'm going with this. I think that perhaps your uh, 
critique tends to be a, a bit Agambenian at times. And Agambenian in this sense, even in a democracy, even in an emergency regime, even in a state of siege, not all citizens and non-citizens, and if you want to be, say like, like this, not all subjects will be under the same type of uh, securitizations. It's not going to be equal. Right now in the US, uh, we, are un we are still under the war on terror, of obviously I'm going there, and only certain uh, subjects are the ones that are under the framework of terrorism. Others are not, and will never be. The Ku Klux Klan cannot be defined a terrorist organization by law, by US law, uh, uh, because terrorist, terrorism by US federal law is only foreign organizations. The KKK is a totally domestic one, therefore it cannot be considered a terrorist organization. Um, <laughs> um, but even within, uh, Gina was talking about populism, even yeah, nativist populist regimes, you can see how this type of uh, um, state of emergencies are going to be applied in a racialized or in a nationalist way. The other is going to be defined in certain uh, ways that not uh, and, and not the one that is part of the US. So another example. Yes, in Israel, probably an anarcho-syndicalist Jew is, is going to be surveilled by the Israeli state, but it's not going to be subject to the same securitization process as a Palestinian or an Arab Israeli. And, in, in, and all, even within democratic, and again, going to the US case, which is the one I know the most, even in democratic uh, cases where you do not go to what you mentioned as the crisis, you can see different, uh, uh, different strata of citizenship, even if they're all considered formally citizens, where either they're Native Americans that, that are going to have in a different type of plenary power uh, or uh, US nationals living in Puerto Rico or blacks during Jim Crow. So all of these different, so what I mean is the point is, I do agree with you, but I think that perhaps you should add or for the future, uh, the role of uh, emergency regimes in colonial uh, settings, and not only colonial settings as we understand Algeria or India, but also the US, and particularly in their colonized, uh, more or less colonized subjects. Thank you. I'm going to respond now to, uh, to Jean's um, uh, comments about, uh, certainly there is a, here an underlying um, or hidden dialogue with uh, Hannah Arendt, because uh, for me, uh, her theory of revolution precisely represents uh, the emancipatory po potential uncontaminated uh, by the political logic of dictatorship that um, uh, has become uh, a kind of uh, a dominant, um, has a dominant presence. And uh, this uh, project uh, on dictatorship uh, is an attempt, is also a, a broad, a, a consists of a broader attempt to rethink political modernity, not uh, from uh, the uh, abstract principles of rights um, uh, or of uh, human rights, but uh, from the institutional dimensions uh, of the modern state uh, as informed by dictators. So I want to, to show that uh, the Republican le legacy had some pernicious effects uh, in the constitution of political modernity, uh, precisely because uh, they uh, renew it and revive this biopolitical security logic uh, uh, of the Romans. Uh, when we speak about security, for example, even the etymology of the term, security comes from uh, uh, Latin. Uh, it's um, secura, it's, that is to be free from cure. I'm secure when I don't need to be cured. So in that sense, I'm secure when I'm healthy. And uh, that was a Roman language. The idea was that if they, since uh, the Romans understood political conflict, but not only political conflict, political division, to go back to Elefordian, uh, logic. Political division as something uh, unhealthy and uh, something uh, that needed to be treated uh, by this violent means of, uh, even if constitutional regulated, by, me by means of dictatorship. It means that here we have the birth of a particular imaginary of the political uh, that became dominant uh, in modernity. This is what this um, genealogy I want to trace. And I, I want to uh, also uh, disassociate for democracy. That means uh, uh, because modernity is not for me really democratic. Modernity is really Republican. Uh, the revolutions were mainly Republican, modern revolutions, Republican revolutions against uh, uh, the ancient model of democracy. But um, uh, it's not that I have a kind of uh, fetishized version of uh, democratic politics. There are inherent dangers. Uh, 
uh, certainly. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the dangers of democracy might be very different from the threats uh, of republicanism. Uh, and uh, the institutions that democracy can uh, uh, devise uh, in their multiplicities are uh, reflections of this, uh, uh, an awareness of these uh, uh, imminent dangers. Uh, what might be an Im Im imminent danger of democracy? Can be a kind of uh, a majoritarian uh, deviation, a majoritarian absolutism. It can be a forms of demagogues, uh, certainly. Uh, and for this reason, um, there, are, there were institutional devices that can be thought uh, can address this, although uh, always the dangers do remain. Now, about the populism, it seems to me that it's more of a republican phenomenon in the sense that uh, plebiscites, uh, plebiscitary democracy was uh, the way the uh, plebeian uh, assemblies uh, were meant to work by acclamation. Uh, Greek uh, assemblies uh, never acclamated, uh, they debated, uh, the, they discussed, uh, they deliberated, and then they decided. The Roman assemblies have to say yes or no uh, to proposals made by them, uh, to them uh, by other um, uh, institutions, and this we find it in Rousseau. So the idea, for example, uh, uh, of plebiscitary democracy, for me, it's not uh, a, a democratic problem per se, it's a problem of, re it's a republican problem. Democracy has other, other, other threats. Yes, the, uh, the other uh, reference to Schmidt, uh, I think one has to understand that, uh, at, at least this is my interpretation of Karl Schmidt's political work, that he was responding, <coughs> and by that he was influenced by the Bolsheviks. Uh, his main interlocutors were, was the threat of the uh, Russian Revolution that he tried to, 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 to uh, uh, respond to it, but uh, by appropriating elements. So when he argues that democracy and dictatorship are um, equivalent or coexist, he was just reproducing a Bolshevik argument. No one made that argument before the Bolsheviks. Not even Marx, Engels, they never argued that democracy and dictatorship uh, are the same. Uh, so uh, Schmidt, in a sense, might be called uh, the the Bolshevik, uh, the Lenin of the extreme right uh, at the beginning of the 20th century in, 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 some, in some ways. So uh, when it comes to, 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 to inherent threats to democracy, uh, my reading is very different from Lefort, uh, in the sense that uh, the, the tendency to unity, to homogeneity, to sameness, uh, it's not uh, a predominantly a democratic threat. Uh, it's predominantly a threat uh, incubated within republicanism. Republicanism has a problem with division. Democracy was uh, open up this division in the public assemblies. The rich and the poor could confront each other publicly. Uh, the rich could, uh, the philosophers could, could disagree with uh, Athenian democracy. Only one died uh, because it was the most extreme of all. But all the others lived uh, a very well life. And not only they lived a good life, they rushed into Athens. Even when Socrates was executed, new philosophers recurrently came to Athens. They didn't go to Sparta to philosophize. They didn't come to Rome to philosophize. They came to Athens. So, uh, my, my, Especially at that time in Rome, I think it would have been a little absurd. That's correct. Uh, so to, to, to Emma's issue, yes, there is probably uh, a presence of uh, Agamben's theory, but I think it's a very... Uh, tendential. Uh, it's not uh, that Agamben has uh, shaped uh, my understanding of uh, re republicanism. Uh, actually, I find uh, the, the work of uh, Foucault much more interesting on, on biopolitics, uh, on the biopolitical. But what I want to argue is that uh, if we are looking for the historical and conceptual and political origins of what we might call biopolitics, uh, they can be found uh, in the, for, for the first time, at least in Western uh, history, uh, in uh, the institution of dictatorship. And Agamben uh, doesn't go there. Uh, he doesn't dis dis actually he argues that dictatorship does, does not represent a state of exception. In the book on state of exception, his dictatorship is not an emergency institution. Uh, so uh, there are many disagreements, uh, but uh, the, the basic, uh, the basic um, uh, argument is that uh, the moment uh, when political conflict, political division, political disagreement uh, became a threat to the unity, uh, the survival, and the order of a political community is when dictator, the logic of dictatorship emerges. Uh, in uh, other political traditions, we don't find this fascination, this obsession with uh, the, the, the uh, 
the lethal, let's say, effects of the conflict and, uh, and division. We find it incarnated in the very institution of dictatorship. So I would say that uh, the, the meaning and legacy of dictatorship uh, is precisely the legacy of uh, unity above conflict, uh, order uh, above disagreement, uh, and uh, harmony above uh, division. And this is what dictatorship was meant to do. And uh, today we, we have um, um, uh, tried to detach the logic of dictatorship from the logic of the, the biopolitical logic of security. And I try to bring them together. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I see Carlos Alvarez, uh, uh, who actually is in Guadalajara at the moment. It's so nice to see so many uh, people from uh, some different parts of the world. So Carlos, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And um, to me, it seems that uh, the concept of the concept, sorry, of crisis, public health, or even order on, and life are actually void concept, concepts. I mean, are concepts that are the void of uh, any uh, fixed content. Content, sorry. So. Uh, those concepts are actually are to be filled with content accordingly with uh, the, the lead in power or the or the, uh, the state itself goals. So much of what the state does when it securitizes objects and objects are is to actually pose threats uh, instead of identifying dangers. So my question is. Uh, doesn't it constitute a paradox in the core of the state theory and its institutionalization as a guardian of order? I mean, the state institution as institutionalizes itself not by protecting, but as actually posing threats. So it poses itself as the only one who can actually solve those emergency states that it itself creates or these emergency states. And that's my question. Thank you. If there is no one else giving me a blue hand at this point, Andreas, uh, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Carlos, for your, uh, your question. Uh, there is, a, in a sense, a paradox uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the foundation uh, of, the, of the state theory, uh, to the degree that, uh, on the one hand, uh, it pro as I see the paradox myself, uh, it promises order, that's the, the main mechanism to, to, to guarantee security, uh, but at the same time, uh, it tries also to promote uh, at least the constitutional liberal state, uh, as Andrew mentioned in his uh, earlier comments, uh, to promote liberty. I think that's the, 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 the central uh, paradox, or let's say the enigma uh, of the modern state, uh, that it wants order and liberty, but uh, liberty generates conflict, uh, dissension, uh, disagreement, uh, and contestation. Uh, order, on the other hand, um, uh, wants uh, appeals to um, uh, harmony, unity, uh, and security. So how can you have uh, order and freedom uh, in this particular uh, um, uh, composition of, of the two, uh, uh, let's say, elements in tension? And it seems to me that uh, the state uh, is using the discourses of liberty uh, and freedom as uh, a pure ideological device uh, uh, precisely to um, strengthen uh, the requirements of order and security in the sense that we can be free only if we are secure. But they forget, uh, this ideology forgets uh, that uh, freedom uh, is a risky uh, enterprise and political freedom, like Cornelius Castoriadis said, uh, has a tragic dimension because it tends uh, to uh, trans transgress its own limits. Now, Castoriadis found uh, the, the main institution uh, to limit that uh, uh, hubris and that tragic dimension in the, in the practice of uh, theater, in, in tragedy, that was a mirror image for the demos uh, to see its limitations and its uh, uh, transgressions. Uh, there might be other, more, many more mechanisms, uh, but uh, certainly the, the state uh, has the tendency sometimes to create crisis precisely to legitimize itself. That said, however, uh, following, let's say, Machiavelli, politics is also the realm of the unpredictable. Uh, crises will emerge. They are not only created uh, or are, um, ma manufactured uh, uh, artificially by the state. There will be moments of um, unpredictable dangers. The question is what might be a democratic response uh, 
that will be different from the Republican dictatorial security one that became the statocentric one. So that's uh, the, another way of searching uh, for ways, uh, uh, for uh, approaches to, to the question of uh, uh, crisis resolution uh, outside of the Republican uh, uh, paradigm. Um, now, another issue that uh, relates maybe to authoritarianism, uh, it seems to me that authoritarianism is a subclass uh, of the dictatorial uh, logic. Uh, usually author authoritarian discourses appeal to the same principles and use, and use mechanisms and, um, and means uh, that uh, refer back uh, to the basic logic of uh, dictatorship. Uh, but they do it in a different way, although the logic, I think, uh, uh, remains there. Uh, that uh, authoritarians, uh, for example, today, what we might call uh, democratic authoritarian uh, uh, currents, uh, populist currents uh, uh, of the right, uh, in particular, uh, use the term uh, law and order all the time. Uh, law and order was uh, one of the dominant slogans of the modern state and of this, its legitimation. So these authoritarian uh, uh, manifestations today, I think they are deeply embedded uh, within the structure of the modern state uh, and uh, also the inability of the liberal constitutional state uh, to limit them or to uh, abolish them. Because on the one hand, you have the, the constitutional promise, uh, promise uh, to limit uh, state power uh, to limit its absolutist uh, tendencies, uh, to keep it accountable, uh, to um, uh, devise, uh, divide its powers. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there is the predominance uh, of the idea of order and security. Uh, order and security can be used against anything, against uh, uh, so-called terrorists and against uh, irregular migrants in the same uh, way, or against an, an internal enemy. It's not by chance that uh, uh, current uh, uh, authoritarianism of the right uh, also use an anti-communist discourse uh, as if the left uh, is still a threat uh, today uh, to the existing order. Bolsonaro, Trump, uh, and many others still appeal uh, to the communist threat. This we see it, uh, today in uh, Peru, in the, the coming elections uh, where the left candidate is considered to be uh, a communist that will uh, go back to the shining path. So in other words, uh, even the question of authoritarianism today, I'm not so sure about populism, but certainly about the, re the return of some authoritarian tendencies today, have been, they have to be situated in, in a long durée understanding uh, of political modernity and not to be seen as a, um, a exceptional uh, uh, appearance uh, in the present as a, a purely conjunctural phenomenon, uh, but they have long uh, links uh, uh, with the logic uh, of the, the, the dictatorial logic of the modern state uh, that uh, prioritizes security, threat, uh, life, uh, even with the virus, the pandemic, uh, the same logic uh, that uh, life uh, is the foremost principle uh, of politics, the foundation. And therefore, if life is any threat to life, uh, can uh, be treated in the same uh, oppressive uh, biopolitical security way. And that actually today we live at a high peak of biopolitics uh, with the way the states are trying uh, uh, to face the question of the pandemic. Mainly authoritarian solutions. Okay, we have uh, Jean and then again me briefly. I think both of us should be brief. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just, you know, I. I'm not quite sure what you mean by it, but of course I'm I'm a Democrat. And um, but I mean I'm I'm still not convinced by the way you portray democracy in actually such a monist way, meaning that it's only plurality and freedom. In other words, um, you know, democracy entails the rule of the people. That's what the word means. Uh, you're the Greek, but anyway. And how can you pretend? How can you actually say that the logic? of identity, and again, it sounds like Schmidt, but still, is not, a, is not there constantly, always from the beginning uh, as a possibility. The, the idea of extracting, who is the people? Extracting the people from the people. Um, or the idea that the majority is actually, um, gets at the truth, or it's not just right, it's just not just a, number, a matter of numbers. I'm talking about the negative side, the, the negative possibilities and dynamics. What democracy ever avoided that? Certainly not the Greeks. 
I mean, I, you couldn't possibly say that all the people under Greek law were considered the Greek people. That would be a tough one. Um, so again, I mean, I'm not doing some politically correct thing about oh, they had women and slaves, but but that there's a I think that there's a dynamic there, and a a a, 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 part, a a partial dynamic. I'm not okay. The other part is also freedom, uh, participation, voice, publics, all this. I agree. Um, so I think that this the problem of unity and plurality are both there in democracy. You can't pretend that um, that democracy, I mean, you might say, okay, it's because it was linked up to popular sovereignty like Hannah Arendt does, and that's the problem. That's why this thing goes in my, I'm not convinced. Um, it's the same thing with people rule. Uh, and then the other thing that constantly baffles me is that, yeah, I mean, you're talking about this logic of the modern state, but I mean, what are you imagining? I mean, ancient Greece was a city state, but I think it had some dynamics too. There were some issues there. Uh, um, in terms of colonies and all of this, but uh, I can't imagine what you're what what um, what you're thinking of as where you would go. So I'll stop there. To make okay, change. so that was short. Uh, I will uh, really make three short ones. Uh, one is, and you answered it already. I was going to ask you if your views concerning the need for emergency institutions has been altered by the COVID crisis, and I can already see the answer is no. So there is no no reason to uh, to push that forward. I I would have thought that uh, perhaps one would think about the problem uh, again, given that we are undergoing this. The, the the second question, which is a perpetual one, I ask you, but I ask you uh, nonetheless, is that do you still hold on to what is the Schmidtian view that emergency institutions cannot be limited, even if they are formally limited, they cannot be limited. Uh, I think that the history of these institutions, if you look at enough countries, uh, would not lead to that conclusion. If you focus on Weimar and Article 48, of course, you would come to that, uh, that particular conclusion. The third is really a comment to Emmanuel. I think uh, domestic terrorism is a category in the United States. Uh, and indeed, uh, the January 6th uh, perpetrators are under, uh, uh, are being, uh, uh, prosecuted under domestic terrorist uh, uh, visions. There have been Ku Klux Klan acts, by the way. So the very example you choose is wrong because there was a Ku Klux Klan act already in the United States and it is still on the books. Uh, so I think that the idea that uh, in the United States, uh, uh, terror by white people is permitted, uh, but not by brown uh, people from abroad is just not correct. And not to forget the criminal law, under which the very same people could be prosecuted also. Uh, uh, okay, uh, that's it. Yes, uh, thank you again, uh, Jean and Andrew, for your questions. Um, I, I don't see the logic of, here I'm uh, anti schmittian I don't see the logic of identity to be the logic of democracy. Actually, democracy in its different uh, manifestations has already been uh, predicated on, uh, on conflict and disagreement. And uh, I see the, the idea of um, uh, a popular, large popular direct assemblies in whatever uh, historical uh, manifestation uh, they, they acquired in, in history as precisely the, the, the space where the divisions become open, uh, public and uh, debated. Uh, so that uh, the, the idea of uh, democracy as an identity, I think uh, uh, Schmidt uh, takes it from a non-democratic thinker, mainly from Rousseau and the Rousseauian tradition of this kind of a homogeneous, the people as one, as a kind of homogeneous entity that uh, does not take uh, the, 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 the central uh, presence uh, of public conflict, uh, of public disagreement uh, as being fundamental to democracy. That democracy is not only about majority rules, it's about uh, reaching maybe some majoritarian outcomes through public debate and free public debate. Also take into account, for instance, uh, the institution of paresia, uh, free, the, 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 the courage to free speech uh, that was precisely to, to empower the, the citizens uh, to speak freely. Now, when you speak about the people, here uh, I agree to a degree, but I disagree uh, in another, uh, from another perspective, because uh, the, 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 the notion of the modern notion of the people carries all the elements that you mentioned that might be pernicious uh, to 
democratic politics as we understand the sense of this kind of homogeneity. And for this reason, I think it's uh, the moment to reflect whether the people uh, is the right category to describe uh, the political subject of democracy. In the last few years, as you know, I'm uh, uh, moving in the direction that the political subject of democracy is not the people, it's the poor, where the category of the poor does not include uh, all these abstract uh, homogeneous elements uh, uh, of the category of the people. Uh, the poor uh, has a completely different, uh, uh, different connotations, are the disenfranchised, uh, the excluded, uh, uh, the dispossessed, uh, and I see democracy as being the political, the political imaginary of uh, of poverty, than uh, being uh, the the expression of uh, a collective, uh, uh, um, the the manifestation of uh, a popular will in its unity. Uh, this is a, a not, this is will be another discussion for another time, but uh, certainly it will uh, maybe a uh, shift the perspective from uh, this uh, category of the people uh, that is uh, very problematic, uh, according to me, uh, to the category of the poor or the dispossessed. Democracy is the politics of the dispossessed rather than of the people in this undifferentiated, uh, indeterminated uh, uh, notion. So, uh, and also where I'm uh, uh, heading to, I think uh, I'm uh, trying to reflect on uh, or to explore the idea of uh, a federated council uh, democracy in the tradition of Castoriadis, Arendt, uh, Lefort, before he became all too liberal, when he also discussed the importance uh, uh, of councils, uh, and to try to renew a tradition uh, that was defeated historically, uh, but uh, still might be uh, relevant today to think beyond uh, the state uh, as the only organizational uh, territorial uh, category uh, for our times, uh, and to try to resurrect, uh, to revive uh, the theory of federated councils uh, in a new way today, not uh, uh, in the old 19th century uh, forms. Now to, to Andrews, but again, I cannot say much because I'm only in the beginning of this kind of uh, uh, explorations. Uh, to Andrews about uh, emergency institutions in the pandemic, yes, they made me even um, more concerned uh, that the pandemic was uh, treated in this kind of, um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a purely security, uh, issue uh, and not uh, as a, an issue of the public good. Instead of uh, investing in uh, hospitals, uh, in uh, health, uh, they invested in uh, repressive mechanisms. So um, there might have been other ways of, of addressing this, uh, this problem that will not have uh, uh, enforced uh, the, the powers of the state once more. Once we had the terrorists uh, two decades ago, and then we had the migrants, and now we have the the virus. Uh, all this in the long term, again, it's uh, just a, a hypothesis, uh, will increase the powers of the state uh, to an incredible degree. Now in Europe, uh, they speak about the, the passport uh, of, the, of, of the healthy. The healthy will have a passport and all the poor populations around the world uh, that uh, they cannot have access to the vaccine will not be even uh, able to move, uh, although they were restricted in their movements, they will be more restricted to the movement. So in Greece now, we are going to have all the rich, wealthy Germans, French, and Italians coming, but we are not having uh, people coming um, from other uh, regions uh, that uh, used to. Brazilians used to travel to Greece, so they cannot travel anymore to Greece. So these are uh, multiple forms of exclusion based on the biopolitical logic of security once more. So I'm very much concerned about uh, uh, the way this pandemic has been. Um, of course, I'm not going to, to Agaben's extreme position, uh, in this issue, also I recognize that his criticism had an element that uh, required some uh, some discussion, rather the way he was uh, marginalized uh, in the public space in uh, in Italy. Uh, emerging institutions cannot be limited. Sometimes, of course, uh, they can be limited, and they have been limited uh, uh, in multiple occasions. But what is important to me is uh, to think whether uh, emergencies uh, that is a real ontological uh, crisis. Uh, can be uh, faced and addressed uh, in a different way. Uh, is the only way to increase uh, executive power, to militarize politics, uh, and to disempower freedoms and protections of citizens uh, is the only mechanism, uh, the only uh, path uh, to, to face the unpredictable, what uh, uh, Machiavelli will call the Fortuna? Is the only way to call Fortuna the only way to to use violence as you use violence against a woman, he says, 
or uh, against a river? Are there other ways uh, to face uh, the, the unpredictability uh, of politics that will be more um, uh, compatible with uh, democratic ideals that is outside and against the dictatorial logic of self-preservation? Uh, this is uh, something to, to reflect about, and uh, uh, this is uh, the direction I want to take. Uh, because ultimately, emergency institutions tend to depoliticize the crisis and to increase uh, military power. And in that sense, I'm not, uh, um, I don't think they are uh, uh, consistent with uh, a democratic commitment, as I, at least I understand it. About terrorist legislation, I have to say I'm not uh, uh, very uh, informed about that. But certainly in the United States, there has been lately a debate uh, that uh, also has um, some echoes, echoes in, in Europe, whether uh, the, the emergency legislation has been used against uh, uh, right-wing uh, neo-fascist groups in the same way and in the same with the same uh, uh, force that has been used against um, uh, left-wing uh, uh, terrorist organizations. And it seems to me uh, that in many cases, also in, in Europe, uh, the uh, terror, anti-terrorist legislation is mainly focusing against either the left or uh, Islamist rather than the extreme right. In Greece, actually, there is no le uh, anti-terror legislation against uh, the, the extreme right. For this reason, the Golden Dawn uh, could not have been prosecuted uh, under the anti-terrorist legislation, uh, but uh, only under the anti-criminal legislation as organized crime rather than as political terrorism. And uh, that raises some, uh, some questions, uh, whether a liberal state, constitutional state today understands the threat of neo-fascism and the radicalization of the right in the same way that they understood the threat in the past uh, against uh, left guerrilla, um, urban guerrilla movements. So I think that's, I'm not sure about uh, the United States, but it is a question uh, to consider. Uh, who is the main threat uh, to, the, to the liberal constitutional state, the radical right or the radical left today? And I think they remain obsessed with the radical left rather than the radical right. That well, I, I, just, I, but, I don't think that's true for American prosecutors yes. at all. Uh, and yes, a historical period, this was true. It's just not true right now. And I think the laws, uh, many of the laws are abstract enough that a prosecutor can charge under them, whoever, uh, irrespective of color and uh, ideology. Uh, and just another remark, I think that what has been spent on, uh, on vaccination and hospital uh, equipment and all the rest, uh, at least in the United States, is certainly much greater in terms of uh, money than what has been spent on securitization. Anyway, uh, Antal Erkin, and he will be the last one who will uh, ask a question. You have to uh, unmute yourself, Tony. Okay, I tried, but the system doesn't, didn't allow me. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Andres. Um, my problem is uh, it turned out is connected to, to the last question and answer because what I was thinking about your presentation about uh, dictatorship I was thinking about is there any universal or necessary relationship between violence and dictatorship so this is this is a, an important element of the system or it's more uh, a consequence of the modernity and uh, the birth of the modern democracies that the dictatorship when you were talking about uh, the uh, soviet union and uh, and the soviet i did it, it really bothered me that what happened there it was a dictatorship but it was also a crime against humanity they killed the millions of people without any significant reasons except the power to maintain the power and also this is the hitler and germany but even in greece for example then when the, there was the dictatorship how many people were killed and uh, expelled from the country so what how you can argue that 
uh, it is natural that's again a very important dimension if we are, we are comparing democracy and it can happen in a democracy also but i think somehow the connection is much stronger even exclusive in the case of dictatorships thank you so much yes uh, uh, you're absolutely right uh, because um in my work on dictatorship, I don't focus so much on violence. Uh, that's true. Uh, it, it has a presence, uh, but uh, I don't take violence to be one of the main constitutive elements uh, because I treat violence uh, in the case of uh, dictatorship as a means uh, to, to realize the end of uh, order uh, and security and unity. So I try a little bit to um, uh, underestimate or uh, overlook uh, the, the role of uh, violence. Uh, although um, lately I have tried to rethink it, uh, how I can incorporate it uh, uh, into this, uh, let's say, um, uh, four uh, constitutive uh, significations that define the, the concept of, uh, of dictatorship. But it seems to me that uh, violence has many, it appears in many possible forms. And it might not be what um, really um, uh, defines dictatorship. What is um, a, a, an element that may relate to violence that I emphasize more is the element of fear. Uh, in general, if we take, let's say, uh, an approach informed from Kozelek, uh, the idea of uh, uh, horizons of expectation, I will say that dictatorship opened, uh, as a concept uh, opens up the horizon of expectation of fear, uh, of destruction, uh, of panic, uh, uh, when uh, you hear about uh, dictatorship and also from antiquity on, uh, in, in sen you, you sense an element of fear. Something ominous is going to happen or something ominous is happening. So dictatorship as a, con as a concept conveys uh, the dimension of fear. Now, when uh, there is the dimension of fear, of course, uh, violence uh, becomes uh, extremely central, important. And this is, uh, is relevant uh, in the case of uh, the Bolsheviks, uh, because uh, during the Civil War, uh, they constantly emphasized uh, the element of fear that uh, our revolution will be destroyed, uh, uh, the lives of the workers uh, uh, will be completely uh, crushed, uh, the working class actually, uh, Lenin wrote a, a very interesting uh, uh, piece uh, in 1920, where he said that the, the working class is dying. He's dying by hunger, by war. And the only solution, he says, is uh, absolute dictatorship uh, against any threat. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, if the working class dies, well, the revolution will die as well. And that uh, justified, uh, at least uh, discursively, uh, the mobilization of this extreme form of violence. But I take this um, uh, deployment of violence uh, to depend uh, on the idea that uh, our preservation, our life uh, is at threat uh, and uh, any means uh, uh, is necessary, necessary is required. And within this idea of any means necessary is violence. Violence that will be now unchecked, uh, uncontrolled, uh, unlimited. So violence is important, but I take it to be subordinated to this imaginary of fear of death, of destruction and extinction, that the logic of dictatorship carries within itself. And that if you, if you trans, and I try to show that, not here so much today, but in the article on the Bolsheviks I have, that if you try to project this notion into a revolution, then you turn the revolution from a, a moment of an attempt at emancipation to a moment of existential threat. And uh, therefore, the revolution becomes securitized. Uh, we move to what I call uh, raison de revolution, uh, revolutionary uh, salvation, rather than uh, revolutionary liberation. The idea that, like in Arendt, but many other traditions, uh, Condorcet, for example, Pain, who didn't uh, endorse uh, this kind of uh, uh, logic that was introduced by Marat, that the revolution is a moment of freedom. This is what Condorcet says, who is a bourgeois thinker, after all, and uh, still uh, he got uh, the and pain, uh, understood the revolution as a moment uh, of freedom, uh, rather than as a moment uh, of an existential, uh, exceptional uh, war against uh, extinction. Extinction of the revolution, extinction of the working class, and so on and so forth. So I take um, uh, violence to be a secondary element that can be triggered uh, by this dictatorial logic. 
But, you know, look, Andreas, uh, I mean, of course, your response is wonderful and brilliant, but there are real threats in the revolution, right? There is Denikin, Kolchak, Rango, Western intervention, right? So that's, these things are real. Now, you could say that if you don't dissolve the constituent assembly and allow a democracy to form, uh, all of this would have been much weaker. So they help to constitute the threat against which then they uh, increase the dictatorship. Uh, nevertheless, there would have been threats uh, to, to the best Soviet Republic that you might be able to devise, the best federated Soviet Republic would have had threats too. So in a way, I think ultimately, uh, and this is of course uh, not a real criticism, but it's just what I wanna point it out is that uh, you don't want to admit that there are also real threats and real emergencies. You have difficulty admitting that. And because you don't admit that, you go across, you, you reject the Roman institution too radically. I think that would be my view. And that's why I asked about COVID. COVID is real. Now the response to it could make the threat even worse, uh, but nevertheless, it's an issue. Okay, I'm being told not to do this anymore, but it should be your last word anyway. Yes, no, no, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy you raised again this question because we discussed that uh, before the COVID uh, when we still could meet uh, in person on campus maybe two years ago. And uh, since then I have been thinking a lot about that. Uh, whether, in other words, my argument uh, depends on uh, negating uh, the ontological existence uh, of emergencies, crises, uh, uh, critical moments uh, that uh, might, might pose a threat to something. Uh, but uh, the, the, it's not that I want to, to, to disregard. I don't want to argue that uh, the discourse on emergencies is a status discourse uh, deployed by the state to increase, uh, to justify uh, its use of uh, uh, dictatorial security uh, mechanisms. I, I don't want to go there, although there have been instances, but this is not what interests me. Uh, what I want to explore uh, is uh, a different uh, attitude uh, and uh, positioning uh, to questions of uh, emergency. So, uh, to put it differently, uh, is there a democratic theory uh, of the exception? Is there a democratic theory of emergency? And how differently it will look from um, the Republican one? Um, that's my main, uh, my main um, uh, orientation or the main question that uh, informs this project. And uh, it seems to me that there are uh, uh, other ways to deal. For example, uh, without going back to the ancients, because uh, given my Greek uh, ancestry, I'm going to be accused of uh, Greekophilia and of uh, um, uh, fetishizing uh, Athenians. That's not my my intention at all. But if we look, uh, for example, at the 27 years old war between Athens and Sparta uh, that the Athenians lost, uh, during these 27 years, uh, there was not one emergency rule, not one emergency regulation. Um, uh, Athenian democracy worked exactly, and they made many mistakes, as we know. Uh, they killed, they executed their own generals because they failed in that and they failed in this. They weakened uh, their own uh, uh, resolve. Uh, uh, we know the, that the funeral oration was an attempt uh, to, to strengthen the morale of a demoralized demos. So they were gone, but still they survived. Uh, Athenian democracy survived 170 years. Of course, the Roman Republic survived uh, 450 years. So uh, from that point, you can say dictatorship uh, in, uh, in, the, in the Machiavellian uh, interpretation uh, helped the Republic to survive. But at what cost? Uh, is that, uh, uh, um, uh, in other words, uh, uh, survival of the absolute uh, unconditional end of politics, that we should always be concerned about how to survive for a longer period of time, continuity, longevity, la lasting, uh, the idea of lasting foundations, lasting republics, uh, rather than having an experience uh, uh, that might be more short-lived, uh, but might be more emancipatory. In other words, to put it now in a populist formulation, a populist, in a metaphorical formulation, what do we prefer to be? Uh, Jimi Hendrix, who died quite soon, uh, but uh, created uh, an amazing music, uh, or the Rolling Stones, who lived and lasted for a long time, but represented the collapse and the corruption of rock music? I will go with uh, the experience of Jimi Hendrix against the experience of the Rolling Stones. Democracy has this kind of um, more ephemeral, and not so lasting dimension, but it's much more uh, 
uh, profound. Um, it leaves traces of emancipatory memories and possibilities that are stronger from the Republic that lasted so long but ended up in its own uh, imperial dissolution, in its own bloodbath of the uh, first century. Athens didn't have this bloodbath, it was conquered by the Macedon. That was it. Uh, this is how an Athenian democracy ends. It's conquered by an external power. The Roman Republic for one year, for one century, from the Gracchi to uh, the civil wars of, uh, of uh, Caesar and then of uh, Augustus ended uh, in a complete um, uh, killing bath uh, that uh, Athens never had, never experienced. So that's also a kind of subjectivist, uh, more subjective um, uh, orientation to those questions, whether something short-lived might be more intense and more true than something that lasts longer, but is completely corrupted in the end and loses even its meanings, uh, the, the idea of the Republic uh, uh, the ancient Roman Republic at the end lost its meanings. Even the Republicans were disappointed with the Republic. The Athenians could not be disappointed because they were uh, invaded by the Macedons. So they didn't have the same historical challenges to face. So that might be a way of answering. I know it's not the scientific uh, uh, informed uh, way, but uh, uh, it's uh, my own uh, uh, orientation to these questions. It's very beautiful anyway. Thank you very much.